there is a story also um, that I printed off over the weekend uh, relating to young men going to prison, particularly sex offenders, as it turned out. And um, it was also talking about, uh, you remember the young man who was convicted of raping five underage girls in Tauranga in the Bay of Plenty, uh, South African background or extraction. It was 17 or 18 when it happened. And there was outrage throughout the country. Uh, the sentence is now being appealed. Oh, the sentence was appealed by the Crown, too late as it turned out. And eventually the High Court dismissed the appeal on the basis that it was out of time. But that set off um, an investigation into what kind of rehabilitation would be offered that young man um, and sex offenders like them. And um, one who has taken up a role in suggesting that our court system uh, and our prisons are not doing their fundamental job, which is not simply to punish, but to rehabilitate offenders so that when they are released, they offend no more, is the former Minister of Courts and former National MP, Chester Burrows. He joins us now. Chester, good morning to you. G'day, Michael. Good to talk to you again. Yes, it is. You too, my friend. Just to explain to listeners, when I was the Mayor of Whanganui, Chester was the MP, and we worked together on a number of things. You were a fine local, local member, can I say. Um, Chester, go on very well. you not, you're not very well at the moment. No, I'm getting over it. I went, <laughs> short story, went and had a tooth out in February. It never healed. I got worried that it might be cancer. It was diagnosed as such, and since then I've had to have a bone taken out of my leg and a jaw reconstruction, which is why why my voice might be a little bit muffled. Um, I've just finished six weeks of radiation and chemotherapy, and I'm sitting here waiting to um, feel better. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, that must have been incredibly debilitating for you and your family. What's the yeah? Kicks you around a bit. Oh, I anyway. Bet. Um, so yeah, the, the yeah. prognosis is hopeful? Yeah, it's it's one of those things where if it doesn't come back in five years, it's not coming back. And there's about a 40% chance that it won't come back. So I want to be in the 40%. Yeah, I, I understand. Very best wishes to you. As you know, my daughter had um, cancer. Uh, yeah. And she was Proxima Sesset last week at the school prize giving. So she had oh. a... She had a ten percent chance of surviving, so I, I hope you take her odds and and do and beat this, Chester. So, so Lucy must be about twelve, thirteen, or no, she's 14, seventeen. Or? Oh bloody hell! I know, hasn't oh, time marched on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so she finished year thirteen, and um, yeah, she was a proxy assistant at um, Mount Aspiring College last week. So she's having a gap oh, year, and she's going off to university. Wonderful school too. Oh, that's terrific. Yes, um, mm. we're very pleased for it. But it just goes to show, though, uh, I think attitude means a lot, isn't it? So, And I know you'll have the yeah. attitude. Um, yeah, I think it's like the rest of life. It's all about the top two inches. A- absolutely, absolutely. Uh, my friend, uh, you've actually become quite an old liberal in your old age, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, 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 I think so. You were a conservative. I get accused of being in the wrong party by both parties. Yes, that's right. Um, now... You have the central thesis that we're f- prisons are failing in their job because we're not doing the rehabilitation side of that for those people who are incarcerated. Is that right? I don't, well, we we do we do a lot of rehabilitation. A lot of the rehabilitation stuff we do is good. Our recidivism rates are very high, ra- largely because of the wash through. We get about thirty thousand people going to prison every year, but the vast majority of them. Um, don't stay because they're short termers, they're young, um, they don't change their minds, they never get offered any rehabilitation because they're not there long enough or they're there on remand. Nearly half our prison population is on remand awaiting a hearing now. It's yeah. not actually convicted people. Yeah. Um, but we, we we changed all our, tightened up all our bail laws and so now we've got a much bigger prison population that we would necessarily need or would have had. I'm not, I'm not saying we didn't need to do something, but um, we changed that. So it's really difficult. It's not unusual for people to be in prison awaiting a trial now because our, our court system is dragging its heels and it's behind so slowly. They might wait two and a half years for a trial um, 
uh, which, which they have the right to plead not guilty to. Yeah. And uh, and they don't get any rehabilitation while they're while they're awaiting trial. And then if they get there and and they and they get a prison sentence of say three years, well, they're going to be basically out on time served, and they won't get any rehabilitation. And we're just going to drop them back into society again. And who would be surprised if they didn't come back? Um, so, so the problem is the court the system, or the problem is the prison system here. You're the saying the court system. Oh, you're saying the, right through. The, the whole lot. Well, we, what we know about people who go to prison is is that they are vastly undereducated. Um, they, ninety one percent with a diagnosable mental, mental health illness or or addiction. Sixty five percent with previous head trauma. Um, and they come from lower echelons in society where they've failed in employment and just about everything else. Uh, you know, there are, there are, there are obvious um, others who don't, and depending on their offending classes and those sorts of things. For instance, sex offenders come from a whole range across society. But, but largely the people who go to prison in big numbers are those guys and uh, the ones who do harder time on, on in tougher um, classes of confinement get less and less opportunity to do, to uh, to rehabilitate too. So it's not surprising then that 65% of them offend again within five years um, and and often go back to prison again. And you say, well, you know, why aren't we doing something with them? And it's, a, it's an obvious question. But we have to look, we have to accept as a society that if all these preemptors are people who go to jail, then there is a criminal justice responsibility for the Department of Education, for the Department of Welfare, for the for MB and those in charge of the economy and getting people into work. And we can't just say, you are a dog, you're born a dog, and you're always going to be a dog, and it's all your fault. And the other problem we have is that we recognise that a lot of these people, and sex offenders fall into this class again, have been offended as children. We have to call them victims until they manifest the, the symptoms of their victimisation by offending, by, say, drug taking or, or bad behaviour or other assaults or other sexual offending. And then all of a sudden, they're an offender and we've got no time for them. And we have to accept that uh, that isn't the case. You know, it's a much bigger picture than to say this is just a justice issue. It's a health issue. It's a welfare issue. It's an issue for the economy. It's an issue for all of us, really. Mm. I guess there's two responses that you'd have. The, the automatic one of normal people in society would be, but I want to be protected from those people and I want my children protected from them. So I, yeah, I, I, totally. don't, I don't want them anywhere near me. Um, yeah. But you're saying, well... It's sort of inevitable, given that they've been offended against themselves or they've sort of been raised by the mongrel mob or by wolves, which isn't yeah. too dissimilar, they're going to end up like that. And no one intervenes mm. from the moment they're born until they end up in the justice system. Is that right? Well, well, I've been knocking around the justice... I've been having active roles in the justice system for 45 years. Mm. And, and, and what you do see is... Um, where government agencies have abrogated their responsibilities, schools were particularly good at, knowing crap was going on at home and never doing anything about it. Um, and and then the same with welfare. We know you you take a child and put him into a welfare home, and um, and he's got a far better chance of killing himself. So nearly half our youth suicides were children who had been in state care at some stage. Um, uh, much better chance of failing in society, much better chance of going off to prison. If mum and dad have both been in prison, the child's put into state care, they've got a 17 times more chance of going to prison than your kid or my kid because we didn't go to prison. Um, and 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 that's worse, and, if, and that's worse rate than if we just left them with the parents. So it, it, is, it is that thing. I totally agree, though, that we need to be kept safe from predators, but there's nothing safe about putting someone in prison, not rehabilitating, letting them back out again because it's time served or whatever, and and then you don't know that they're not living next door to you. No, I agree. And you've got no right to know, and, and I don't think necessarily you, you should have a right to know because then society would never take responsibility. I, 
I think I'm sick of people saying it takes a village to raise a child, but no one wants to be in the village. Oh, listen, I've, I've always hated that saying as well. Um, yeah. But I'm a conservative. So yep. I go from the line of, I don't disagree with what you say, but one of the things that I have said, and you know my views on gangs, if you yeah, are yep. raised in a gang household and you're living in, say, the Mungu Mob in Wanganui in, say, Akatia Street or somewhere like that, and you're, yep. it's sort of normal to get involved in these internecine gang warfare and all that sort of stuff. The chances yep. of a child being raised in that environment actually going on to become a tr contributing member of society are not high, are they? No, they're not. And and that's that's the same. It's that, like that old Jesuit proverb, you know, show me the boy, give me the boy until he's five and I'll show you the man. Yeah. That's exactly that. And I think about clients that I had as a lawyer where, you know, as a, as a two-year-old, he, uh, the mungle mob kid was put up against another mungle mob kid and it was like a cockfight and and the, and the adults were betting on who was going to win and and so what a surprise then that this guy grows up as a 25 year old to be incredibly violent and then what do you do then and and but but what what you can't do is just say oh well you know that's you for the rest of your natural we've got to you know that I am a liberal and I and I believe in redemption. So I think that we can fix people, and and we but you can you can only do it by getting in close and and actually um, almost living their lives for them in a way, giving people the opportunity to to walk alongside them. And we've seen some social experiments where this has worked incredibly well. For instance, um, you know we had a program where we had. Every every solo parent under twenty had a um, budget mentor who who walked along through life with them. They got their benefit on a card, and and they could they had a little bit of discretionary spending, but the rest of it um, they couldn't spend on booze, tobacco, couldn't get money out of the um, out of the wall, and couldn't uh, get takeaways. Mm. And and what happened then was that you know we had four thousand three hundred of them in New Zealand. Within two years, it was down under, well under 3,000. So you actually can change the pattern of behaviour if you care enough as a society to put people in close to those who need it most. And and a lot of these people are actually screaming out for some sort of assistance. So I know that gang, gangs are growing largely through, well, part of it, Australian government policy and, and part of New Zealand's policy of keeping it at arm's length. But... We do need to accept that it's a it's a problem we're going to continue to have. Yes, um, and but it's intractable. I'm glad that you're talking this way, Chester. Um, it's intractable because it seems, on the one hand, liberals don't want to intervene in the with the directness that you're talking about, and on the other hand, conservatives don't want to pay. Um, for the rehabilitation of bad people. In fact, they suspect that those bad people will misuse that rehabilitation. Your yeah. Well, there's yeah. no proof of that. I mean, my, my argument would say, if, you want to, if your mantra is you've got to have an evidence base for the government policy, then you can't say, well, we'll do that for climate change, but we won't do it for criminal behaviour. Because in, that, in actual fact, a lot of our rehabilitation, for instance, New, New Zealand's sex rehabilitation rehabilitation programs are the best in the world um, and, and a lot of our youth justice stuff is as well and it's mirrored by other countries who are what and, and now they've taken on our policy and actually doing better with it so it actually does work but the problem you've got really is is politics so you know when I when I was in opposition I happily pushed the tough on crime button and and we got some good votes out of it um, now, National, my old party, is doing the same thing, even though even though it knows it's turning a blind eye to the evidence, but recognises that, that there's votes in it. We've got a we've got a Labour government with a a majority. They could do. They commissioned a report which we've given them with a large number of recommendations. Some of them would cost nothing, um, um, and none of them are very expensive. Um, and they haven't done it. And they haven't done it. Why? Well, if they try doing something like that, no doubt, they're just handing it back for the opposition to vote them with. So it's about a will, but, but no one can convince me that we've looked at the evidence and we shouldn't be doing this. Actually, if you look at the evidence, you'd be doing a hell of a lot more. Mm. 
I, I see the point that you're making, but I guess in a lots of ways, Chester, there isn't an integral policy here. Everybody's got their own little part of the pot, you know, education, yeah. social welfare, courts, justice, um, et yeah. cetera. And there and doesn't the seem... Problem, yeah, carry on. That's the, action, that's the problem that you, we were talking about before. You know, because because the system, criminal justice system isn't joined up, and that the courts have no say on how how many people the police arrest and put before the court. The the, the jails have no say on how many people the judges decide to send to jail. Um, community has no say on on when people get released and and what they do with them when they get out. And and then you've got the others, and and actually it's only. It's only politicians and bureaucrats that do this. Is that they divide the tax up? You know, you and I just pay tax. We don't know what our ratios are to various departments. We just pay tax. And it's only when you become a minister, as I've been, or or a bureaucrat, that you say, "Not out of my pot, buddy." And that's why you get education and saying, "Oh no, that's justice. That's not education." The fact that these kids are undereducated um, and all that has got nothing to do with us. We we have them. We only have them five hours a day for 10, 10 or twelve years. Well, actually, you have them five hours a day for ten or twelve years. What are you going to do with that time? Mm. No, it's, and, it's, and I think yeah. that's that's my argument. No, I, it, it, listen. The problem is we don't think in depth about these issues as well. Um, but I. I <laughs> So, I mean, it'd be nice to be able to sit down for a week, shove everybody that's relevant into a room, maybe a month, I don't know, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and work out something holistic that works for everybody in this, including the victims um, as well. Mm. But we don't have that. Absolutely. Um, the, the second thing, though, is this is uh, the, the part that worries me, and I've shared this with you before, but I don't think we've ever stated it publicly, is that if it's Maori, Europeans don't like to go there, Pākehā in particular. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? So one of the reasons I've often thought the mongrel mob and the black power have been able to get away with as much as they have without some sort of intervention is sort of the argument that, well, Wanganui we gave me uh, after uh, Gia Tatua was shot dead, and that was they're our yeah. people. Um, yeah. We'll look after them. And I thought, I, and I can remember saying to the Maori tribal lead, uh, then, and you'll know who it was, well, if you had been looking yeah. after them, this wouldn't have happened. Um, you've sort of yeah. abrogated your responsibility to do that. What do you say to people who say that? I, I, well, firstly, I think there's validity in what you're saying. I mean, the, the fact is that they're like a, they're, I think they're better at looking after their the people they would rather not see than what Pākehā are because, because they do acknowledge the connection, whereas Pākehā don't. They look at themselves totally as nuclear families largely and they only want to celebrate success. Um, but at the same time, you're quite right, although there's a real there's a bit of an inevitability there in that the, 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 the failures... Like we talk, like we talk about, and you talk about around years to it, and those sorts of things from our society, they're failures of the whole of society. You know, they're failures of education and health and welfare and all of that as well, as a failure or a blight on, uh, of, of the, on the family. But we're supposed to have uh, a publicly funded safety net that's supposed to be very good in this country, that's supposed to look after those things. So. How big a problem are you asking Iwi to take responsibility for? I don't know so that I'm asking them to take responsibility to... so much as I'm asking them to acknowledge that there's a problem. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that's I think that's only fair. But but the, I I get a bit wound up with with um sorry, just take a sip of water because I'm getting wound up. Yep, you go for your life. I have a bit of a problem with with um, a mantra about our party stand for personal responsibility, but it's only personal responsibility for someone who's standing in the dock. It's not personal responsibility for the bureaucrat or the school teacher or the minister or 
you know, the other lead community leaders who actually didn't do what they were paid to do to ensure that these people didn't become statistics. And and until we get some sort of accountability, I, I don't think we're going to drag people back for mistakes they made or for what they didn't do 20 years ago. But what I mean is we have to acknowledge as a society that this is all our problem and it's all our problem to fix. This idea of saying, well, you know, not out of my bucket because, you know, I'm, a, I'm in a different category. I mean, one other little glaring statistic no one ever knows about is about 5% of the prison population is actually out of the combat trades in the defence forces because because people get um, respond in different ways to trauma or whatever. They get kicked out of the defence force with no... Um, with with no uh, transition, and and you know you can't go and be a turret gunner for telecom, can you? No. And so you end up making bad associations. If you happen to grow up in Aramo, you've got all sorts of connections. Your brothers and mates and school kids you went to school with and neighbours all belong in the gang, and so you go back and associate with them, and you find yourself in trouble and big trouble. Can I so ask? You, can, I ask you, uh, yeah, can I ask you a question on that one though? Just. Sorry to labour the yep. point, but what's the solution to gangs? I mean, we've seen this proliferation over the last, oh, I was going to say five years. I mean, it's just, it got worse yep. once the uh, Australians exported everybody. But what's, uh, yeah. no, no, I mean, and you can get tough on them as you like. Uh, certainly, la ironically, nationals seem to be going down the path that we used to go down, you and I. Um, yeah, And yeah, have finally yeah. got there 15 years too late, but there you go. Um, but, What's the solution? You can crack down on them. You can put them in prison. But how do you stop people going in in the first place? Well, you, you, ha you have to do a couple of things. Like, firstly, the initiatives you're going to take now with the very young. Or, so I would say you've got to get down on your hands and knees and fully integrate with families that obviously need help. And, and gang, and that includes gang families. But you have to also recognise that they've got those associations, and you're not just going to say stop because um, they've, you know, they've already got all those associations. So you have to get donkey deep in there and and recognise that you've got an issue. But what are you going to do with all the ones in the lag time? Exactly. So the ones who you start working now, yep. what are you going to do with all those twenty year olds or the fifty year olds who are still? who are still manufacturing methamphetamine, pretending they're not, and and all that. Well, you just have to hit the hell out of them. But some of the initiatives that they'll be doing in relation, and it's included some gang people, where, you know, they, 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 do, a, they do a search warrant, they, they find on a phone who the people they're dealing to are and actually line them up with, um, with uh, meth rehab and those sorts of things and health issue, health people rather than charge someone for purchasing for personal use of methamphetamine, they hold it over their head and, and make sure they go and get some treatment. And they've done that in Northland and they've done it around the Waikato and it's actually worked quite well. So recognising that that we need to take a new look at some of these perspectives and the people that we want to get are the people who are making big money out of gangs. And the issue we have, of course, is that now uh, gangs have got the ability to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in bribes and in, in um, their activities uh, that they never had before when they were only selling cannabis or, or synthetic cannabis. And so now they've got a new product. And when you talk to police leaders in other big cities overseas, they are very happy with cocaine and heroin and methamphetamine only being 15% of their Class A stuff because of the way it responds to people. And they have pity on New Zealand where methamphetamine is such a huge part of our, um, of our drug trade. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm worried about the future, I've got to be honest with you. I, I, and I guess it's something you think about as well. So am I, yeah. Um, yeah. I, Very much so. I I'm I'm struggling to see a pathway out of of this mess, and I haven't identified anything as a f a solution. Have, have, are you in the same yeah. issue? Well, I I I think that there is a pathway. There can be a pathway forward, and and in the um, obviously I back the report that we gave Tūruki Tūruki, but. At the same time, we didn't say anything that they weren't saying 30 years ago. Mm. 
and the issue has been an abrogation of responsibility on behalf of governments and society. Now that's all pie in the sky. You're saying, well, what's the plan? Well, the first thing, it has to be a plan that, that all government agencies are signed up to and is actually driven. Um, and I think that the public, the thinking public, is up for something more than just bigger prisons. I mean, we would all accept that we probably live in the best country in the world, and yet for some reason we lock up so many people. You know, we're locking up about 170 per 100,000 of our population. But if you look at Maori, you're locking up about nearly 600 Maori per 100,000 Maori. Well, what the hell is that all about? And it's not, it's, you know, it's, there are no civil answers to that, but it's got to be addressed. And it has to be something that's really progressive. And I'm, I'm disappointed that given the ability that the government has had to uh, have the report, but also the numbers in the House to pass anything they wanted, uh, that it didn't happen. Yeah, I've heard you say this before, and I guess my simple answer would be, because I'm a simple man at heart, um, the reason that people are in prison is because they do bad things, irrespective of yep. their ethnicity. Um, and yes, you're right, it's not good that that many Maori are in our prisons, but um, are you suggesting that there is a bias that puts a Maori in prison and, a not, and doesn't put a non-Maori in? That's exactly right. I mean, there's studies that show that 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 if you've got to, if you've got a Maori and a Pakeha offender with a similar offending record on the same charges, Maori is far more likely to go to prison, far more likely to be in prison on remand rather than get bail, far more likely to do longer time, um, and far more likely to do harder time, and far more likely to. Um, uh, have less available to them on release in terms of uh, support and more likely to come back to prison. And the only differentiation is uh, ethnicity. So so that is that is the situation and we need to accept that actually we've got a racist justice system as well. And people hate to hear that, but it's true. And when you talk about the high proportion of Maori in prison, we have to remember that, they, that so many of our Maori are in the same social demographic that most of our prison population come from mm. and they're vastly overrepresented so it's not surprising to see them there mm. but uh, you know historic we talk about and people might scoff at this contemporary colonization i mean the fact is it's in short if if you take an economic base off an indigenous population um uh, educate them in a foreign language badly make them only really eligible for the most vulnerable of employment, so they're in and out, um, and 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 so they they aspire to do less. They uh, they uh, feel loss and those sorts of things. Not surprising that 140, 150, 160 years later, they're all cor- corralled in the in the lower socio-economic um, situations, doing poorly than anybody else in every measure of success, like health, welfare, education, the economy, all of that sort of stuff. To, to think that that just happened because Mary don't want to work, which is the sort of stuff that I get from people when I get a bit of a bash around the ears on Facebook or whatever, is just ridiculous. No, I'm not. And so- I don't want to live in a country where we're quite happy to write off, you know, a big chunk of our population. No, I'm not suggesting that. But I guess where I would just again, you and I would have a discussion is around. Well, wait on. What about all the Asian migrants that come to this country who have English as a second language, who don't have any um, cultural basis here, uh, who have left their cultures, their homes, and yet I consistently see them walking across uh, the school stage at prize givings, scooping all the major academic and uh, and cultural awards. Um, Yeah. I mean... Well, there's two. There's a cultural alienation (laughs) there from the moment they arrived, but here they are often within the same generation, well, succeeding at a level that Europeans aren't. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I just, yeah, I don't know about the alienation. I mean, they, what, what, it's like we said right back at the start in relation to health, it's all about the top two inches. So actually, if you look at the, um, if you look at uh, the post-colonisation um, 
uh, messages that have been going to Maori, you know, all, all, all your leaders were criminals and failures. You know, we're, gonna, we're not going to teach you about your, your proud history. We're not going to teach you anything about that. Um, and then, again, you fail in education. So you all leave school at 15 and go to for the freezing works. And the freezing works shut, you're unemployed for a couple of years. Then you get a job doing something else, which is menial, and that shuts down, and the economy takes a dive, and you're first off the bus again. Then actually, that is what you're teaching them. Whereas people who move from one country to another country are upwardly mobile. Um, they've usually got some money behind them. The, what they're teaching their kids is something totally different because they've been successful in education and in business, and it's a totally different it's a totally different situation. And and that's that's why, because they've got the, those kids getting different messages, and there's a totally different level of expectation. And you know, the, the father who's who's working in health and has had tertiary education can sit and help the kid with the homework to make sure that they do as well as they can, and that's why they're stars. Mm. Whereas whereas others don't have that opportunity that we're talking about who fail. I don't know. I, I think okay. I, I I think you're overestimating the socioeconomic basis of many of these migrants. But putting that to one side, um, you mentioned something there that resonates with me and or resonate with a lot of our listeners, and that is um, the Maori working in the freezing works. And it took me back to a time yep. we're talking 80s here um, and prior yep. to that. And it and and one of the things, and maybe I've got this wrong, but it, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Um, Maori seemed to be succeeding in that system and that culture much more. They were working in the forest. They were working yep. uh, for the Ministry of Works. They were working in our freezing works. Now, admittedly, that they were, um, you might describe as menial or labour type jobs, but gee, they were well paid yep. in the freezing works. That's why they were That's working so, there. Yeah, yep. Um, and the same with the things like the trade trainees. Yep. That's the other one. Maori really, trades. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But but the thing you know when you look at a different country, eh? So in 1974, the New Zealand dollar was worth 134 US cents. You know, and we had a totally assisted economy. You had a top tax rate. If you if you did half an hour's overtime, you paid 66 cents in the dollar tax. So so that's a different. The, the country was no longer prepared to to have that sort of workforce and we scream about oh we should have all this back again had this discussion yesterday over a couple of years funny enough but but the problem is now we want to have lower and lower tax rates and and we taught new zealand through the 80s with with accrual accounting and rogenomics that uh you know you pay your tax we'll do this and other than that it's user pays well it's just it just doesn't work yeah. that's why that's why vulnerable people in our economy will always be there. They'll be first off the bus when the economy goes down or when the work shuts. And look at look at all those you know, party of freezing works where I was turning up as a local policeman about 80 months after it shut. I mean, the place was just devastated. Mm. Uh, but I guess... I, I, so I, I don't usually mean to say I sometimes get it right because I've got so much wrong in my life, but... <laughs> if there's one thing that I got right was that even in the 80s, and you could probably see it too, um, the National Party of the late 80s um, had a good conservative element to like you and me, all who said this is the wrong way to go. Yeah, and well, they changed sides basically, didn't they? They we, did. Was, we became the party on the left. Yes, and, and but we were old-fashioned conservatives saying, prove to me that what you're going to do is actually going to make it better. I'm not interested in ideology. I don't care um, if Margaret Thatcher's done it. You proved to me, and yeah. we never, and for some strange reason, the National Party in opposition said, yeah, yeah, that's the way to go. As soon as it got into yeah. power, Ruth Richardson, bang, that was the end of that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's right. Because remember, though, that they came in in 1990 and, and there'd been a complete lie about, about the state of the economy. Yep. And on the Sunday after the thing, you know, Mike Moore had to ring Jim Boulder and say, you're going to have to bail out the BNZ $600 million or all these Kiwis are going to lose their mortgages. So so they were campaigning on a, on a false impression in any event. But I think there was a very strong 
ideal in those days, you know, the National Party was considered the Presbyterian Church at prayer or something, but uh, about, I am my brother's keeper. Yes, that's right. You know, we're, yep. we we're, are responsible. we're after the war, yep. we're all in this together. Yep. You know, half half of our half of our ministers were ex um, returned servicemen, or sorry, we were returned servicemen, and so there was that. And and then through the eighties, it was nah, it's I'm all right, Jack, and you look after yourself. That's it. Yep. And we'll, we'll we'll charge you less tax, but you're going to have to pay. Yep. No, you, you're right. And and that's when I chart the decline of New Zealand at exactly that point that that philosophy yeah. took over, and we. And that's when we end up with these massive disparities that you and I are talking about. And that's why I'm saying to you, at the end of the day, if you want to make sure that what you're going to happen, we don't have an economic system mm. at the moment um, no. that is going to make the kind of policy changes that you want to happen, is it? Do we? I, I, can't, I can't see it. I can't see it on a, on a low-tax base um, as, as people keep on striving to offer more and more tax cuts. Um, I, I can't see that, and even though even though salaries in some sectors are going very very high, um, we've got the same people earning less and less, mm. and and that's the that's the issue. Okay. So as, as long as we stay, it's all your it's all up to you, Jack. It's not going to fly. But anyway, uh, I'm living hope. Well, uh, I'm a dreamer. No, it's all right. There's nothing wrong with dreaming. Uh, Chester, can I say thank you very much for coming on the show and talking to me. You've had a long and illustrious political career. Uh, for Just to explain to people, Chester was a policeman, a lawyer, uh, and then went into politics um, and then became a minister and now has moved into, um, I guess, the NGO field. I wish you well on your health journey. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you will thank succeed. You. And love to your family. Thank you. God bless and love to yours, Michael. Good talking to you. You too, mate. Look after yourself. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Um, that is right. Chester Barrows, um, who has... And I'll be interested in your thoughts um, on what you heard. Now, Chester is an old-fashioned... Well, he's become a new liberal, actually. 